So yeah, today we're going to talk about design for intent approaches to interactive technology, and that's different than what we looked at in cognition and cognitive support apps, and it's different than we looked at in computer-mediated communication, and that this one focuses on especially behavior change and motivation. Behavior change is part of a clinical approach to problem solving, such as taking uh, on addiction and trying to break addictions like smoking or alcoholism. And now, though outside of clinical approaches, it's applied to everything from developing a better habit to brush your teeth daily to working out more regularly. And that focus, again, is around motivation. So what is motivation? Well, to quote a colleague of mine, Eric Cobb, he sees it as balancing your cost to benefit of a particular action. And we might take Alan Dix's approach here and say that it's about balancing perceived cost to perceived benefit. So getting to class versus sleeping in might be that kind of an equation. An app that's pretty naive might just optimize on getting you up and to class, so it's effectively setting an alarm with maybe a text message that says, hey, you have to get to class now. Um, but a real coach may be more subtle, and this may be where better apps in this space could come from, which says, oh, I know that you pulled an all-nighter last night, so actually it might be more important for you to sleep in, catch up on some of your sleep debt, so that you can make your afternoon classes. But that brings us also to tracking, because these applications need data and that's the main way that persuasive technology works right now which is actually again pretty naive at this stage it's lots of counting or comparison so for instance there's a lot of calorie counting step counting pounds counting heartbeats counting and the comparison side is things like people like you do this too so why don't you do that especially around shopping amazon.com made this kind of recommender system approach to shopping Famous. And then it's got another good piece of persuasive tech, the one button or one click buy. That helps a lot. But again, we come back to the question of who holds this data to make these suggestions? And that leads us pretty quickly to the ethics of persuasive technology like surveillance. Persuasive technology can be other than an app. It can be deployed at the infrastructure level. We see this in things like CCTV with signs that warn us that CCTV is on. Or it can be insurance companies forcing employers to have their employees track their health data with sensors like Fitbits um, as a complement to their health practices. So that Fitbit suddenly becomes kind of a ball and chain potentially. The complement to surveillance though is Steve's man surveillance where we have watching the watchers. You can check for a Latin expression, quis custodia et custodies. Who watches the watchers? Well, here we can see examples where this inversion of surveillance, putting it into the hands of the watched, can be a powerful use of technology for social and cultural change, maybe, uh, which may lead to political change, maybe. The Arab Spring is an example of that. Looking at the shootings in the States of, for instance, the white cop of a black man uh, caught on an individual's camera um, has been a powerful uh, instigator of a response, but has this led to legal changes or political changes so far? Not clear. But why computers? Why do this? Well, computers can be where people can't be, and that's a real attraction to things like health providers to be able to say, we can be here when you can't be and a lot cheaper. And a popular component of this kind of persuasive technology is something called just in time. We did a piece on being a just in time, time intervention using heart rate and uh, skin conductance and movement and time of day in order to try to predict a possible emotional eating occurrence. That's when somebody eats, not because they're hungry, but because it's a response to stress. The idea was to figure out when this was about to happen in order to cue an agreed intervention, such as asking somebody to call you or to have a soothing text message show up. It's a little bit more complicated than just tracking, but it's still, again, not clear entirely how great that is for helping to learn about dealing with an issue rather than just sort of giving you a shock when something comes up in the behavioral sense of uh, Skinner and Skinner boxes. If you haven't seen those, do check that out. The other question is, what's the exit strategy for these technologies? Is one supposed to wear a Fitbit forever? How does it work to learning new skills rather than dependence on a battery-powered technology? So we can look at that 
uh, to say, well, there's a lot of opportunities, challenges from the ethical standpoint to the knowledge standpoint to what are you trying to do to how long do you expect people to be on this? Do you want them to be dependent or learn skills? How are you going to do that with this technology? Also, most of this technology is deployed at the individual level, but to have a effect at scale probably needs to be deployed socially. So we might need to think higher up and what are the challenges of not an app for that, but an infrastructure for that. So there's huge opportunities with persuasive technology to become pervasive technology, if not surveillance technology might have some surveillance in it. And this brings us to the conclusion of our third kind of interactive tech in terms of cognitive communication and now intent. See you later.